Thanks very much, Professor Attridge. And welcome to everybody present here in person, to those watching the live stream, and to those in the future digital present. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to introduce this year's Bartlett panel, celebrating the 200th anniversary of YDS. To bring back our own brightest and best is a true celebration of their work and of YDS and their initial graduate formation. It also gives a chance to our current students to see what life could be like in a few years time if they work hard while they're here. It's quite logistically challenging to bring people from West Coast and East Coast in the middle of the semester. So thank you very much to our panelists for making the effort to be here. And thank you to our administrators for enabling that also. The real joy of this evening, however, is seeing our field develop before our very eyes. Our speakers all work in Chinese or Japanese theology, but from different perspectives. Ethics, literature, philosophy, comparative religion, and in many cases, their jobs didn't exist when they were here. And it's these young professionals who are shaping the field as it expands. We're privileged to have a preview of the future tonight. Since I happen to know we have three excellent talks to enjoy, and we've given each speaker 15 minutes, I'm not going to extol them anymore now. But we'll introduce the three speakers in the order they're speaking. And then after the talks, if there's any time, I'll offer a few brief words. If not, we'll go straight to the questions so that you can all participate. And there is a reception afterwards along by the rotunda in the Sarah Smith Gallery, so you'll have a chance to chat informally to our speakers over a glass of something. Our first speaker, Dr. Stephanie Wong, is Assistant Professor of Global Religions at Villanova University. She graduated from YDS with an MDiv in 2013. And she completed her PhD at Georgetown, working under Peter Fan and Erin Klein, among others. Her scholarship focuses on the development of Catholic theology in China and on comparative theology, with a particular interest in the interplay between Christianity and the Chinese religio-philosophical traditions, Confucianism, Taoism, Mahayana Buddhism. Her new book, National Witness, Chinese Catholicism After the Age of Empires is under contract with OUP Oxford, and she generously gave a precy of today's paper to my World Christianity class today, so thank you very much, Stephanie. Dr. Haruka Umetsujo is Assistant Professor in the Department of Religious Studies at Santa Clara University. After finishing her MDiv at YDS, all three of tonight's speakers overlapped in their time here. She took a PhD at Harvard, working with Mark Jordan and others. Haruka's research interests span Christian theology, East Asian literature, feminist and queer theories, and post-colonial studies. Her first book is a theological reading of modern Japanese fiction and poetry uh, between the 1860s and the 1930s, focusing on themes of the divine, eros, and women's flesh. And it analyzes how, in the context of Western colonialism and modernism, those themes were transmitted, adapted and reinterpreted by Japanese writers. Our final speaker, Dr. Peng Yin, is Assistant Professor of Ethics at Boston University, where he also serves as core faculty in Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies and affiliate factory faculty in the Department of Classical Studies and the Center for the Study of Asia. Peng took an MAR from YDS and followed this up with a PhD at Harvard, working with Mark Jordan and others on Aquinas and Shunza. He's currently working on two book projects. The first, tentatively entitled Persisting in the Good, Thomas Aquinas and Early Chinese Ethics, explores the prospect of different religious traditions actually speaking to each other intelligibly. The larger project on Chinese political theology traces religious conceptions of sovereignty from early Confucian canon formation through Taoist and Buddhist negotiations with imperial power to the neglected role of Christianity in the founding of the Republic and in Chinese communism, through to the contemporary political significance of Chinese Christianity. So perhaps we could all welcome our speakers. <laughs> First up, Stephanie. Thank you for the opportunity to return here to YDS. It was all of you who made my time at YDS so rich, and it's an honor to speak among friends and scholars I respect so much. 
In my reflection on the divine in East Asian perspective, I'm going to reflect on the question of the divine in light of Chinese conceptions of temporal reality. After all, up until the 20th century turn towards Marxist historical materialism, Chinese philosophers and ritual practitioners generally did not conceive of time as a historical progression, nor posit economic development as the ultimate moving power of the events of history. Rather, Chinese texts and material culture long expressed a less teleological, but more dynamic sense of shi as seasonality, timeliness, of waiting and action. I would like to recover this traditional Chinese sense of dynamism and wisdom in Chinese systematic theology. In the history of Christian theologizing, the church has often engaged in an exercise of considering whether and how to adapt philosophical concepts, literary genres, or ritual practices from the wider social milieu. In the case of China, Christians often found it not only necessary, but theologically enriching to draw from existing resources in the Chinese tradition. For instance, rendering God as heaven tian or Lord of heaven tian ju, or logos as Tao. And my project here is somewhat akin to that, looking to see how deep conceptions of reality in Chinese culture, especially in this issue of temporality, can enrich our sense of God. To build my case about God as shi or timely, I want to make three observations about the temporal and Chinese material and philosophical history, and about the capacity of Christian scripture and communities to affirm it. First, I'd like to note that our very experience of time is already culturally and technologically conditioned, and to point out that throughout most of history in China, engaging with temporality was a highly active enterprise. Consider the practical question of how we mark time. Most of us today perceive time as those ratcheting numbers in the corner of our computer screen, 535, 536, 537, or as we click through the weeks or months of our Google calendars. We play a relatively passive role of time dispatchers or consumers trying to keep up with the clock well enough to apportion future bits of time to the right events. But for millennia, people in China marked time by burning sticks of hard incense, xiangzhong. And depending on what you were trying to do, set a clanger to drop as an alarm clock, adjust divisions within the long summer or win short winter days, time some steps of a ritual or cooking project, you would choose the incense and the, the stencil maze for the ember to burn and trace through. So this was a very active kind of time telling, a really time setting, where you could not but help be conscious of your own role in starting the fire and using its fragrant burning for this or that practical or ritual purpose. Setting incense alarm bells may sound mundane, but it's just a small piece of what Confucians thought everyone from the ordinary cook to the most powerful king was doing in life, for better or for worse, engaging life efficaciously, not simply weathering the passage of time, but wielding their interactive potential. As Huang Chunqie puts it, the temporal in Chinese culture is a situational timeliness, not of impersonal events, but of a humanly shaped milieu, the vectorial or directional performative urge or force, shi, pulsating in the lives and performances of historic, historical individuals, and thus we shape history. So part of my motivation in wanting to adopt this sense of timeliness, shi, is the hope that such resources in Chinese culture can help Christian theology reclaim a sense of the metaphysical malleability and spiritual potential of time. Whether because of Western post-enlightenment historical consciousness or Chinese Marxist historical materialism, we moderns are so prone to regard time as just the simple backdrop, backdrop stuff of history. And so we underestimate the constitutive potential of not only human action, but divine action too. Second, let us consider that Chinese thought conceived of heaven, Tao, the supreme ultimate Taiji, all these concepts as contiguous with cosmological reality and known but not exhausted in the interplay of oppositional dyads that make up that encompassing reality. 
Now, I think this notion of the Tao being contiguous with reality can initially sound threatening to Western theological ears, like a denial of the possibility of truth or the denial of a space for God to exist as ultimate. And maybe it is a kind of denial of extreme form of transcendence if you know, we imagine Plato's realm of the forms or perhaps Origen's picture of the souls contemplating God in a kind of static uh, space above the changeability of the world. But as Tang Junyi notes, when ancient Chinese philosophers spoke of the world, they were thinking of and affirming the world that we're living in, the spiritual material cosmos of existence. They're not referencing a world or the world, but are simply saying world as such, without putting any indefinite or definite article in front of it. And in the ways of world as such, we see the dynamic dyadic character of Tao all over the place. And what do these dyads do? Well, I think they give us a way of explaining change, even without appeal to external intervention of a kind of extrinsic kind. In the Warring States texts, we see it everywhere. It's in the Taoist Zhuangzi's discussion of the interplay of yin and yang giving rise to things. It's in the early Confucian and Moist suggestions that living and aging involves the condensation or the dispersion of qi, vital force. It's in Chinese military texts like the Sunzi's Art of War that assumes strategy involves a reconfiguration of situational and effective dyads like far and near Jinyuan, strong and weak, Tiang Ruo, uh, uh, offense and defense, Gong Shou, arrogance and humility, concentration and dispersion, and so on. In other words, life existence is always a situational navigation and management of these dynamics. And so the truly admirable figures, whether Tao sages or Confucian disciples or Moist generals, they are those who become adept at this work of positional composition and reconfiguration, giving way or moving decisively and keeping with the Tao of what is appropriate to do. I think what this achieves for us is a sense of both great unity underlying all things, but also the possibility of real change. By contrast, I, I often think of Kosuke Koyama and he has a, a strong contrast between um, Christianity, which he sees as linear, and God is this kind of external intervener who does stuff in history, uh, versus Buddhism, which he characterizes as you know, cyclical and, um, and non-interested in ultimate uh, decisive changes. And he, he's always worrying about how to get those two things together. How can you have uh, the justice and the interventions of God in Christianity along with the sense of unity and harmony that he sees in Buddhism? Well, I think in Chinese thought, this sense of imminent composition can help to overcome the subject-object dichotomies that, if static, become deadly to any theological sense of our relationship with God as alive in time. So many post-enlightenment theologies have worried, if Kant was right, then how can we say it was possible for the mind to know God? In my own Catholic tradition, uh, Transcendental Thomists have put centuries now of effort into, poor, into trying to bring God back in from the unknowability of being an object so radically outside us. But this is less of a problem, I think, in traditional Chinese philosophy, where the task was never primarily a subject, subject object know what, but a dialectical reconfiguring know-how. This can serve as a better starting place for Christian theology not falling into clunky spatial renderings of God as somewhere other than reality, nor reducing our worldly experience to just a matter of geographic space. I'm thinking here of Chuck Matthews' call for Christians to reconceive the world in a truly religious and even eschatological mode, not as the where, but as the when in which we live. And here, traditional Chinese assumptions about yujo, about the cosmos, are well suited to grappling with the way in which we live during the world, amid its contingent configurations of reality as we know it for now. This is the time terrain where God can work and bring about change. This finally brings me to the query of this panel, the question of God and the divine in East Asian Christianity. 
A Chinese Christian theology can and has embraced a picture of God as par paradigmatically timely, for sure, operating in season with appropriateness. This timeliness can sometimes involve wise waiting, in the Chinese sense of the word, uh, like when you need to delay to the right time to plant the crop for the year. Or it can mean moving at the crucial moment in a quagmire when it is most possible for an intervention to succeed. This is what Shi connotes. I think the Christian biblical narrative is interested in this aspect of God. In general, it seems God speaks and acts very slowly across centuries of patriarchs and prophets. Sometimes God seems to delay as when God gives the Pharaoh of Egypt 10 warnings through Moses, and only when it has come to a breaking point brings the Israelites out of Egypt in Exodus. Other times, God moves quickly and decisively. In 2 Chronicles, after the Babylonian exile, in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, we're told the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah. He stirs the heart of Cyrus to allow the Jews back to Jerusalem, stirred the heart of the priests and the Levites to go rebuild the temple, and boom, the time has come. So too in the Gospels, timeliness seems often key in the narrative, and people's anxieties in the midst of that timeliness as they wait for things to be worked out. This is key to the pastoral and revelatory effect of Jesus' work. I think of moments like the wedding at Cana, where Jesus turns water into wine to save the bridal family's honor in that moment. Or Jesus raising the girl who has died, though he tarried in healing a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. Or he shows wondrous efficaciousness in feeding the 5,000. At least in a canonical hermeneutic, these scriptural texts would have us consider that time does, eventually, show God bringing things to work out, perhaps in the way that Joseph says to his brothers at the end of Genesis, what you intended for evil, God intended for good, in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. And so during the manifold variations of this reality, God is transforming the whole. In my limited time, I just want to close with a few snippets from more recent Chinese Christian expressions in the modern era, where we see this hope of God active in the maelstrom of change, taking what could be chaos and inviting us to love. This is the main thrust of Ding Guanxun's God is Love, Bishop Ding's God is Love, where he describes the world as a matter of Christ's ongoing work of creation, and at the same time, uh, redemption. We are half-finished products, and our duty is to assist God in the project of creation, and at the same time transform ourselves from half-finished. He notes that the cosmic dimension of Christ's role doesn't mean that everything that happens in nature and history is God's work and design. Creation is a long process, yet incomplete, and as Paul insists, it's imperfect and subject to frustration, involving the making of free beings who are not slaves, but children of God. This is a dynamic system in which will and possibility is still up for grabs. Ding attributes his sensibilities on this to a range of sources, especially to the process philosopher Alfred Whitehead, but also he sees it in Chinese thinkers ranging from the ancient Lao Tzu, who he quotes on the Tao being already begotten before heaven and earth and caring mother of all things, to also the early 20th century writer Lu Xun, who writes of all things without exception, being mesh and interwoven into a fabric, ever lively, ever unfolding. Finally, I'd like to share a poem from the recent Oxford Companion to the Bible in China, um, where the anthology highlights a woman Christian writer, Shi Wei, who wrote a poem on the incarnation entitled Emmanuel. And it integrates events from Jesus's life through, with the author's musings. The first chapter, called Christmas Snow, begins with snow falling through a nature-human landscape and the divine becoming incarnate in parallel. On Christmas, a pure snow beyond the high sky falls, thickly and softly covering this mortal world, the surging dust and voice, the stir of body and soul, the merchants clamor desperately, ending in mutely shivering phantasms. The holy bends down, like snow, fragrant and magnanimous, towards the feeble 
and fruitless soul murmuring. Here in this image of the holy bending down amid falling snow and clamoring merchants, we have the divine moving amid a world of both beauty and stress. I am reminded of Paul's affirmation to those at the Areopagus that in God we live and move and have our being. As Rong Zhongtui and Bao Zhao Hui have noted, for many of these late 20th and early 20th century poets, their purpose is to allow readers to fathom the concepts of life and world and values of the Bible in poetry. The biblical faith renews their lives and Christian writers present different connotations, the richness of the thriving of life amid challenges. This is a picture where amidst the changeability and often challenge of life, there is a hope. What we don't have here is an extrinsic God yanking off the, the ceiling of our experience, nor do we have our trust in a history that history will be progressive. Rather, what we have is a picture of the divine present here. The tenor of a Christianity that appreciates God, present in the world as such, capable of moving with a sometimes frustrating, perplexing, but ultimately good and even gracious timeliness. God, including our being and our activities, though not exhausted by them. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to this year's Bartlett panel. I'm very honored to come back to YDS um, to share my own research, which I started with Professor Starr when I was an MDiv student here. Um, in my research, I used Japanese literature as a source of my theological inquiry, employing lenses of postcolonial feminist and queer theories. I believe literature allows us to broaden the horizon of theological discourse, especially with their expressions that engage our complex, that is, flesh and blood experiences of the world and God. Especially in Japan, although Christianity has been a minority religion, writers and artists have been profoundly interested in Christian language and imagery as part of their negotiation with Western modernity and in turn, consideration of Japanese-ness. To begin, I'd like to introduce a short story, excuse me, to lay out some important themes of my research. In 1922, Ryunosuke Akutagawa, a prominent Japanese writer, wrote a story entitled, Smiles of the Gods. The protagonist is Father Rigantino, a 17th century Italian Jesuit missionary to Japan. Feeling like there's something ominous about the Japanese scenery, he prays in church in Kyoto. Suddenly, numerous chickens fill the sanctuary, and Argentino sees a hallucination of the Japanese bacchanalia, the term is written in Latin. In his vision, ancient Japanese people are sitting in a circle and drinking alcohol. At the center, an almost naked woman madly dances. Then the voice of another woman echoes. She asks why the people are so happy. The people answer, they are celebrating a new god. Witnessing this scene, Organtino expects that his, the new god, must be his own Deus. Then people praise a sun goddess who comes out of the stone cave and the place is filled with light. Organtino faints. The next day, Organtino has another hallucination. In this vision, an old man who calls himself a spirit of J Japan declares that Argentino's deus will eventually change into something else in this country with the power of transformation, which has appropriated anything brought from overseas, including the Chinese writing system, Confucianism, and Buddhism. The old spirit argues that this power also works in the West as Greek gods were never conquered, but furtively transformed Christianity. Just the other day, the spirit asked, he had met a Greek sailor who looked Japanese, yet told stories about Greek gods. 
Then the author abruptly ends the story by letting all the characters return to a famous 16th century artwork that depicts the arrival of European ships to Japan. The ending reveals that it was all the author's imagination about the past. As you may probably notice, this story setting is Japan's Kirishitan period. During the 16th century, the Spanish and Portuguese empires brought their Catholicism to Japan. This tradition temporarily flourished, yet was severely persecuted under the ban of Christianity, which was lifted in um, 1873. It was a time when the Japanese empire started to westernize itself under the pressure of the Western powers. This religious history became widely known outside of Japan during the 1970s through the novels by Shusaku Endo, um, internationally renowned Japanese Catholic writer. Akutagawa is Endo's predecessor. Living through the earlier phase of Japanese modernity, Akutagawa addresses the complexity of cultural and religious traditions. Such literary efforts are not entirely unrelated to theological inquiry. The same historical period already produced Japanese theologians who worked on the issues of so-called inculturation, such as Kanzo Uchimura. Indeed, Uchimura had many students who chose to become novelists to grapple with the questions of modernity and Christianity outside of religious institutions. This phenomenon may show a mirror image or reverse pattern of Japanese Christianity. Alongside theological texts written by religious professionals, there took place complicated and long literally engagements with the Christian discourse by Japanese novelists. My research addresses such understudy literature, which may illuminate blind spots of what we usually assume as theology. Let me return to Akutagawa's story. This story manifests that it is impossible to accurately tra excuse me, translate the notion of God because there's no single and simple Japanese or European culture and religion. Akutagawa shows this by juxtaposing texts like collage. For instance, Akutagawa translates Organtino's prayer, Namu Daiji Daihi no Deus Nyorai. Probably Organtino is saying, dear merciful God, Namu is a Buddhist term. Um, sorry, yes. Namu is a Buddhist term that indicates the speaker's reliance on Buddha. Nyorai is Tathagata, and these terms are combined with Deus, a Latin term for Christian God. The reader cannot know to which God Organtino is praying. Probably the scenes based on the famous episode of Francis Xavier, the first Jesuit missionary to Japan, who initially translated God as Daini Chinurai, Mahavairachana. Consequently, his contemporary Japanese equalized Christian and Buddhist deities. In the story, by giving examples of Buddhism and Confucianism, Akutagawa indicates that such a complicated translation process has already taken place for centuries in Japan within Asia. Modernity and coloniality accelerated and complicated this process. Creating the scene of the Japanese bacchanalia, Akutagawa incorporates the Greek tradition. One of Akutagawa's sources is a Greek-Irish writer, Lafgadio Hearn's essay, Glimpses of Unfamiliar Japan. In it, Hearn fantasizes about dancing Japanese people as ancient Etruscans or Greeks. In Smiles of the Gods, watching ancient Japanese people, Argentino invertedly finds the forgotten past of the West, the Feast of Dionysus. Unexpectedly, he faces what the church tried to suppress and According to the logic of the Japanese spirit, the forgotten past has constantly transformed the Christian tradition. There's no religious and cultural purity, even or especially regarding the question of flesh, desire, and eros. Here, we may be reminded of Marcella Althaus Reed, a Latin American feminist queer theologian who accuses theologians of forgetting that they also have flesh and desire. 
In that story, Akutagawa seems to argue that not only culture, which itself is complex, but also fleshy desire has mutated theological discourse, however furtively. Japanese literature seems to reveal this phenomenon rather candidly, elucidating the flow of power and desire which were rendered visible by Japan's chaotic modernity. By destabilizing cultural and theological discourse by collagen texts, Akutagawa's story unexpectedly lets the reader have a glimpse of flesh and desire which have been subdued or concealed by religious orthodoxy. Let's recall the scene a woman madly dances. Its direct source is Kojiki, a Japanese myth, in it, Ame no Uzume, a goddess, dancing, dances showing um, her genitalia to lure out the hidden, hidden sun god, goddess. To this scene, Akutagawa adds Heinrich Heine's essay, Gods in Exile. This text depicts three Franciscans, who are actually Bacchanals, participating in a Dionysian feast, where a woman sings and dances lewdly. This Dionysian image, of course, summons Nietzsche, Akutagawa's favorite writer. In the gay science, Nietzsche compares the revelation of truth to an episode of Babo, a Greek goddess who dances fluttering her skirt over her genitalia. Nietzsche writes, quote, perhaps truth is a woman who has grounds for not showing her grounds, end quote. I would compare this messy collage of texts with the notion of fissures submitted by Kwak Puelan, an Asian feminist theologian. Kwak argues new theological possibilities and imaginations emerge through cultural and social political dissonances. This argument should also be applicable to collage of texts. Tantalizing or indecent truth of flesh may be interpreted as a response to the notion of universal truth that is a colonial principle. Traditional Christianity's punitive attitude towards sex is also of this kind, as infallible reason is believed to regulate flesh. If the recent post-colonial feminist and queer theologies have broadened the scope of theology by acknowledging the complexities and diversities of human culture, race, and bodies, I'd like to participate in this move by arguing that theological writing and speech should also liberate itself from the confinement of narrowly defined reasoned prose. As the goddess mad dance entices Organtino and invites the reader to the mesmerizing depth of desire, literature, an unexpected locus of theology, elucidates the hidden dimensions of Christian images. In such a space, the flesh of Christ may not keep its decency, which is colonial Christianity's obsession. As its abrupt ending suggests, Smiles of the Gods contains much ambiguity in it. In the cave opening scene, Akutagawa does not precisely specify what kind of flesh the new divinity has. While the voice of the celebration is heard, the strong light dazzles everyone's eyes, like the two dazzling men announcing Christ's resurrection in Lucan Gospel. Nietzsche also uses the stone cave image to depict his Zarathustra, who is the double of his Christ. To me, Akutagawa's story is a metaphor for a literally body of divine flesh, which dazzlingly comes out of chaotic imagination. This divine flesh rejects the singularity of culture, religion, and bodies. It challenges our ongoing colonial assumptions of purity of flesh, truth, in theological discourse. This flesh urges us to be open to new or forgotten truths, which may appear to us as tantalizing, discomforting, or even disturbing expressions. This is a rough sketch of my research, and in my first book, I'm working on the literary works written between the 1860s and the 1930s, and considering theological meanings of stigmatized flesh and divine freedom. 
My second project explores similar themes by examining post-World War II Japanese literature, which addresses difficult questions about war atrocities, afflictions, and solidarity. These works show much more complicated forms of bodies, desire, and sex in religious discourse because they combine the themes of the grotesque, eros, and god, and more queer imaginations. Modern Japanese literature, an unexpected theological locus, brings about Christian images that constantly challenges us to reconsider the meanings of theological discourse. Such disturbed theology may appear as fissures or cacophony, but I believe they invite us to encounter and write about the divine in more diverse and liberating ways. And I hope this space opened by Japanese literature would join other spaces labeled as marginal to continue disturbing the boundaries of theology and opening up our imagination around the possible divinity who has unfathomable depth of desire and flesh. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Starr, for teaching and mentoring all three of us all these years and for now convening this wonderful panel. It's wonderful to be here. It was almost 14 years ago uh, when I first stepped into this uh, room uh, shortly after my conversion. It was in this room I first learned the documentary hypothesis in my Hebrew Bible classes and the non-competitive view of divine human agency in my uh, uh, systematic theology classes. And now, teaching routinely on the other side of the podium, I draw energy and inspiration from my time here as a student every day. And for that, I'm deeply grateful. In the short time I have, I want to open my treasure box and share some distilled findings in my two books. Um, for my first book project, Persisting in the Good, um, I've been reading Thomas Aquinas and classical Chinese ethics side by side for more than a decade. The original impetus of this work is historical repair. My juxtaposition of Aquinas and Chinese classics is inspired by the Jesuit missionary Matteo Ricci. His project unfortunately was cut short by the Chinese rights controversy, which led to the expulsion of missionaries and paused the relationship between China and Europe for over a century until Europe's violent re-entry during the Opium War. In the past few days, years actually, the task of historical repair took on an additional burden as the conflict between China and the US intensified. Standing between two empires as a Christian ethicist with allegiance to neither, I began to see the current new Cold War discourse as entangled with a long historical past. The animosity between China and the US is frequently coached in religious terms the conflict is frequently described as a clash between atheistic, authoritarian, and morally dubious China versus Christian, liberal democratic, and morally exemplary America. These are highly dogmatic descriptions of two sealed off entities fundamentally incompatible with each other. In my book, I try to restore the complexity and dynamism of both sides as an antidote to what I identify as three typical patterns of misrecognition of China in the Euro-American world. But more constructively, more positively, I try to explore three theological topics, human nature, ritual, and eschatology. How can these three topics be enriched through a dialogue between Christian and Chinese ethics? So let me take the three patterns of misrecognition in turn. The first misrecognition is to see China as the incompatible other. An obvious example of this is the question of human nature. For example, Max Weber famously argued for the fundamental incompatibility between Chinese belief in the good of human nature versus Christian belief in human depravity. In my reading, I try to bypass these categories overused to analyze the traditions, sinful versus good human nature, conflictual over versus harmonious universe, personal versus impersonal deity. Taking Thomas Aquinas in conversation with an early Confucian scholar, 
Mencius identify a shared account of human nature that is both intrinsically good and inescapably limited, fragmented and distorted. Mencius and Thomas maintain that this human nature is to be realized in a world not always hospitable to virtue. In the face of constitu constitutional limits within and the cosmic limits without, they sustain a tragic sensibility in the moral life and thereby forsaking easy consolations of suffering through cosmic compensation, inscrutable overall good, or apotheosis through suffering. The second misrecognition I want to trace is seeing China as this evolutionary past. In his lectures on the history, uh, on the philosophy of world history, Hegel claims that the Chinese morals never reached true morality. The root problem is Chinese religion's preoccupation with the external conformity rather than inwardness. In this evolutionary paradigm, the Chinese, like Africans and Jews, possessed a racially indexed state and psychologically distinct character, occupying a previous stage in a singular developmental trajectory, sunk in nature and never yet grasping their spiritual potential. The key manifestation of this defect is Chinese reverence for ritual. In my work, I reject this evolutionary negative assessment of ritual by bringing Thomas Aquinas into conversation with another early Confucian scholar, Xunzi. Both share a remarkable agreement on the moral significance of ritual. For both, rituals are needed because human embodiment implies disordered desires requiring bodily rehabilitation. I show the inadequacy of using categories such as civil versus religious, um, um, belief versus practice. These are, in fact, the, the fundamental terms of the debate during the rights controversy. And the result is an alternative model to sacramental theology, which tend to diminish human responsibility or conceive ritual as an external supramundane demand or separating contemplation from action. The third Misrecognition um, is a, a view of seeing China as this therapeutic, this magical panacea. This is evident in Lebanese and Voltaire, which uh, theologians have named as sinophiles. For Lebanese, for example, Confucianism represented the promise of a natural theology. The non-religious construction of Chinese religiosity was designed to uniquely suit the needs of Europe in the aftermath of fatal religious divisions. For Voltaire, Confucianism provided the perfect template for his own incipient formulation of deism. Both figures reduced the complex religious worlds into a mirror image of deism, wholly rationalistic and untranscendent. I counter the sinophile tendency to secularize Chinese ethical thought by putting Thomas Aquinas in dialogue with the precursor of Taoism, Laozi, arguing that both offering an account of virtue that goes beyond Aristotle, rather than separating them in terms of their respective theistic or non-theistic cosmologies, I argue that both Thomas and Laozi refrain from counseling a vision of moral life as simply lifting up resources within the world, thereby encouraging a kind of status quo view about powers in place. In this imagined dialogue, they join forces in summoning a call for radical world transformation, thereby forging a critical spirit to scrutinize the existing configurations of power. My second book project turns explicitly to the question of Chinese religion and politics. I do so by tracing the religious underpinnings of political authority in China. And for this work, I have two sets of audiences in mind. In the first side, I try to complicate Carl Schmitt's field-defining claim that political concepts such as sovereignty are only possible within a European theological genealogy. On the other side, I want to, tr to, to recover the religious dynamic in Chinese political thought, which has been systematically repressed for obvious political reasons. This book has a very long historical span, and my method, my insistence on this is influenced by my teachers here, such as Jennifer Hurt and Catherine Tanner, who take seriously the Christian tradition in all its polyphony and resourcefulness. 
From them, I acquire the sense that any utterance in the present, any moral language, either on virtue or human dignity, are always uttered, even if obliquely, against a backdrop of centuries of ongoing debate in a tradition. Beauty speaks to beauty. I apply the same principle to my study of Chinese political theology. And that's why this current understanding of political authority in China must be traced back to its earliest canonical formation, to Taoist Buddhist negotiations with imperial power, and to the role of Christianity in the rise of modern China. Such a long view also yield some helpful hypotheses for understanding Chinese religion and politics. For example, this long view renders clear the continuous religious legitimization of political authority. From 208 BCE on and in all subsequent dynasties, emperors assumed the divine name of Di, and sacrifice to heaven was the sole prerogative of emperors. This long view also tempers our, uh, our current hope for state neutrality on religion. As Anthony Yu argues, I quote here, there has never been a period in Chinese historical past in which the government of the state in imperial and post-imperial form has pursued a natural policy toward religion. For more than two millennia, the core state ideology has always tried to regulate, control, and exploit all reveling religious traditions whenever it is deemed feasible and beneficial to the state." End quote. In this sense, Chinese state has always co-opted incorporated and censored religions for its own ends. This long view helps us to understand the current state's selective retrieval of Confucianism as a tool for social control and legitimization. It also helps us to situate the current containment of Christianity in a long line of state regulation. For example, similar to the current suspicion of Christianity as a disruptive force, Taoism too bore this suspicion, given that religious Taoism arose as political dissenters in Han Dynasty who sought to overthrow imperial government by force. Historically, Taoism has always been a religion aligned with regional sympathies and local pieties, therefore incurring suspicion from the central government, especially when regionalism threatens the ambition of centralization. Likewise, similar to the current sinicization of Chinese theology required by the Chinese Communist Party, Buddhism too endured state's intrusion in Buddhist education, in its certification, in its curriculum content, requirements, even the adjudication of heresies. The state also demanded priestly registration and a limited number of clerics. Sometimes the restriction can be very brute, as in the case of 438, edict prescribing anyone under 40 from joining the Sangha. If this long pattern is to continue, Christianity will in its foreseeable future stand on the margins of Chinese society. In this sense, I see the future of Chinese political theology will look very much like figures of Lin, Jie, Lin Zhao, Dijie Spanghofer, Martin Luther King Jr., Dorothy Day, Oscar Romero, Zhao Zichen, and Desmond Tutu. And it's in this gallery of saints that I take, I stake my hope in the future of Chinese Christianity. Thank you. Thank you so much to all three of you for such wonderful and rich talks. Now you can see why our field is growing and thriving at the moment. Um, I'll give you just a minute or two to gather your weights. We have about 10, or maybe we can push it almost to 15 minutes for questions. So I'm just going to give like a one line uh, appreciation of each of your work um, so we can have time for questions. Stephanie's paper was very exciting for me, um, partly because it's a work of constructive theology. It's also a work of reclamation, of democratization, a discursive one, a real model of how to do contextual theology. And she thinks about the nature of the temporal um, and ways of marking time. And the notion that comparative time, time itself is comparative and can be differently understood and how that's important for Christian thinking. So I appreciated that. Thank you very much. Haraka's work is closest to my own, perhaps, working between literature and theology. 
um, and exposing the different patterns of text and ways of doing theology in East Asia. Thinking of literature as a source for theological inquiry, and Haruka's work, like Stephanie's, is both today and elsewhere in her writing, deeply constructive. I love it when our students surpass us in their work, especially in its constructive nature, and both of yours. Um, so thank you. As she liberates uh, theology from academic discourse uh, and situates it in literature, in sex and desire. So Peng's work of historical repair is clearly of huge importance as anyone who understands China now and its current political situation will see. Historically, politically important. Thinking about misrecognitions, and, and we can see the immediate actual political purchase in the present of this, in that work of retrieval, of rereading miscorrections, by having really a deep ability to read both classical Chinese texts and ethical, political, theological thought. And there are very few people who can do that as well as Peng. And thinking also about the shared nature of some of the examples you gave between Chinese and foreign thinking and why we need to relook at that and its importance, I think is hugely generative. So thank you to all three of you. And the floor is open for questions. And we have, a, yeah, please, uh, Maria. Uh, thank you so much. It's so good to see all of you. And thank you for the great presentations. Um, I will be quick. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is for Dr. Wang. And I'm very interested in you how to like interpret Kairos in the Bible through this lens of Chinese timeless or Shi. And I was thinking how could our this great concept Kairos enlighten the Chinese understanding of this timeless. Like for instance, like the Christ event, and I noticed you did not mention this most crucial carols when you try to refer to some biblical instance. This is my first question. And second question is for Dr. Pong. I just told my friend I'm very interested in your second book, and I'm very looking forward to look at, to read it someday. And I want to ask: Do you think like um, Christianity or? Liberation theology could become a source of resistance for Chinese, not only Chinese Christians, but the Chinese society, like some source of resistance against the totalitarian government, something like that. Thank you. Can I just ask a clarifying question? Were you saying kairos, as in like the Greek sense of time? Okay, yeah. So one thing I, I think I'm trying to do is use and um, appreciate the strengths of this dyadic, really dynamic sense of unity that underlies um, so much of, of Chinese thought about how reality is constituted, that there's both a kind of unity underlying all things, but also this dynamism and the interplay of you know, far and near and all the rest. Um, that said, I don't think that prevents us from also making distinct Christian claims about how God works in the world. And so I think that what I like about this dynamism is that there are ways in which it can build right to a critical point. Um, and both Taoist and Confucian thinkers in different ways um, did have a sense of, of, of decisive turns in history. And it's not that there is no history in China, right? You know, sometimes that claim is made when reflecting on um, kind of the cyclical character of dynasties or that kind of thing. And I'm, I'm not one who thinks that, right? I think that Chinese thought can handle decisive change. And it's because, um, in large part, it's because we have this system of both uni metaphysical unity and also dynamism that that's possible. So I'm, I think Christian theology can potentially still retain a sense of incarnation as, as a kind of intervention or the cross and the resurrection as decisive in history. I take your question to be trying to make me gesture towards something hopeful in a very bleak situation right now about Christianity in China. Um, and on this point, uh, uh, the post-1949 
China really tells a melancholic story of the communist invention and loss of meaning, right? You're tracing uh, a, a story of utopianism dashed into nihilism and all the way to the present hedonism in terms of consumption and wealth. And so many people have coached this moment of China in a spirit of moral crises. And I think that's where Christianity's strong insistence on the good enters in and Christianity's long struggle uh, with embracing democracy can be a resource. Um, both are highly conceptual and how does that uh, uh, materialize in house churches uh, under extreme uh, stress is, a, is an open question. But at, at the same time, um, um, a precondition for that moral resource has to be uh, uh, um, uh, enculturation of Christianity. You can't insist on creating a Christian self with the precondition of repudiating your Confucian your, or your indigenous religious identity. Uh, and in that sense, China, uh, uh, Christianity can never become a native language as a moral resource. But I share the hope. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? In the meantime, then, I'm going to um, come back to the relationship between dyad and time in your thought, if you want to. Thanks. Um, so I was talking about these dyads because I think they speak to change, right? That's what I think so much of this, these early texts are trying to grapple with, is how is it that change happens, right? Does it have to be an external imposition or are there ways in which change happens from within, uh, within a system that can involve variation? Um, to make this really practical, I think I'm interested in the ways in which getting time right can help our theology grapple with issues, say, say like, of um, the, like ecology, right? Like how does our theological ethics grapple with ecology when we can't actually get back to a kind of pristine time before change. You know, I'm thinking of Australia and how, um, you know, we might h hope to get back to a more ecologically balanced situation, and yet so many of the patterns of how animals uh, and different species relate has been changed by this fence that was built a, a century ago, and that was put up in order to try to prevent these rabbits that had gotten introduced. Um, from, from overseas, you know, so at this point in time, we are already so many layers of kind of artificiality thick that we cannot read what is natural in any simple way, right? And so that, that reality is something that um, I think maybe Chinese thought can help us with in already recognizing that we're already within the flow of change, and yet can we ha nonetheless have some agency? Um, and does God have some agency in reconfiguring these systems, hopefully for the good. Thank you, Harry. Um, uh, I'd like to ask you a question about uh, the Dionysiac motif yeah. that you're finding in. Uh, ask a question about the Di Dionysiac motifs that you're finding in um, in the uh, material you're dealing with. Uh, is this uh, something that's being imported? Um, is it being embraced by um, uh, the Japanese authors that you're looking at? And if so, well, why? <laughs> yes, thank you so much for that question. So I think the 1860s, 80s till 1930s is a very interesting time of Japanese literature because at the time they knew when Nietzsche died. So they were really actively consuming Western literature but in a very different time or like disorderly order. So for instance, Shakespeare, Chosa, Nietzsche, and Baudelaire are introduced at the same time, and then translation was happening all, like, all the time through. And the, some authors are very interested in the critique of Western um, modernity, what is civilization, because Japan wants to catch up with that. So Nietzsche is actually very important for them as sort of a hint for them to critique Western modernity at the same time, Japanese coloniality, because Japan was expanding at that time. So 
this, I think, use of flesh and disorder and eros are also some kind of their political statement, although they're really severe um, under the censorship at the time. So Nietzsche actually really cues um, these authors' political view. I hope this yeah, answers the question. Mm -hmm. And how can we get our students to think more about Japanese Christian literature when so much of it's only in Japanese? What's your answer to you mean like translation? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> I have been translating a lot of short stories as I work on um, my, um, you know, work because not much um, literature like this are not translated. And Akutaro is very famous, actually. She, he is like read by everybody, but not much translated into English, especially these a little bit sort of touchy works. So my hope is like when I'm done with monographs, I publish some kind of yeah, translated piece. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, and you. that's such a gift to the field and so difficult for us all when we don't have materials to use to teach. I saw, yes, Jennifer. Yeah, a question for Dr. Yin about your second book project, which is uh, fascinating and really important. So um, you tell us that if we look at, take the long view of, of Chinese political theology, we see that there has been, um, you know, never been a sec secular, it's always, religion has always been central there, but it seems as though there's a tension between viewing these various religious traditions as sources of legitimation versus as sources of disruption. And I'm wondering if, as you look at the landscape now, is there any sense in which um, one is one of these religious traditions, or, or more, one or more of them, are more co-optable, let's say, uh, than the others, or is there just um, is the reality such that I mean, we certainly know that Christianity has, in various historical moments, certainly uh, proved very useful as a source of legitimation for unjust political powers and so on. So is there a sense in which all traditions are equally subject to, to being co-opted in this way, but also have, have potential for resistance? Or would you assess the different traditions differently in this respect? Yeah, thank you, Professor Hurd. You really put your finger on the major threat of the story in terms of a dialectic between disruption and legitimization. And the second part of your question about how to distinguish um, the r different religions co-optability is actually the substance, the tofu of the book. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. I've already indicated uh, how Taoism has been typically associated with the dissenting voices, especially its emphasis on originalism, its emphasis on mystical practices. Buddhist, uh, 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 Buddhist tradition, although a foreign in the, uh, uh, importation, doesn't suffer the same amount of uh, uh, suspicion as Christianity. And in that sense, it has been um, uh, co-opted quite easily by Chinese um, empires. Christianity is a very tricky um, question because of its uh, polyphony, as I, I indicated now. House Church have a very strong Calvinistic form of Christianity that is highly sectarian, highly um, uh, disengaged with the social forces. Of course, we have state-sponsored churches. Is that what does it mean to have a theology that's synthesized by the state uh, and, and by legislation in, in legal papers? Christianity has to serve uh, the state's goal of communi uh, communist um, prosperity. Um, so both in terms of religion's intrinsic quality, I, I think it can't hide Christianity's revolutionary potential. It can't tame it. It's in inscribed in the person of its founder. At the same time, uh, such complicated political forces through legislation, through a voluntary self-isolation, um, um, Christianity's political power has been tamed. And, and, um, and but at the same time, I would argue it's the, 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 the energy for disruption, the energy for resisting legitimization is intrinsic to the tradition. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question before we go and eat and drink? Hearing none? Going once, fear. Going twice. Yeah. Um, I was sort of um, thinking through, you know, the long history of Chinese interaction with different uh, religious systems um, and, and sort of uh, thinking through a sort of more pre-modern sensibility towards a ritual or, or religious efficacy as both sort of a, a legitimation, a power of legitimation, but also a sort of um, 
physical source of power in sort of like ritual efficacy for actually changing the world and how sort of in a sort of postmodern, dis, more disenchanted, not postmodern, but modern disenchanted world, that sort of actual belief in sort of ritual uh, efficacy sort of not really being present in the same way to, the, to like a, the Chinese Communist Party, for example. And sort of how, what, uh, what challenges does that maybe present for taking a very long view of Chinese history vis-a-vis -vis, uh, religion and the relationship between the religion and the state? made any sense. <laughs> if I'm understanding your question correctly, you are wondering um, in terms of the continuation of religious practices and its languages, right? One's in enchanted, the other disenchanted, to use Charles Taylor's distinction. And in what sense you can um, speak of these traditions as continuous uh, with itself, within itself. You, I think you're absolutely right in terms of the suspicion of a ritual advocacy and this influenced by Marxist materialism in contemporary China. At the same time, um, you also do see the surgence of um, uh, um, indigenous religious practice. Prayer, for example, uh, is, uh, is very much uh, a common practice. And, and, and so the increased um, indigenous religious practice doesn't seem to uh, fight well with the story of materialization. And in that sense, I, uh, I see the continuation still uh, exists. And in, in, in that sense, recent scholars thesis of re-sacralization, re-enchantment of the world still applies in China. Can I jump in and give one no, example? Please. So just because I think it fits well. Um, people are talking about ritual innovation and there's a scholar of Confucianism, Anna Sun, who um, she's a sociologist of religion who has noted how at Confucian temples in China, which actually are under like the museum Bureau, right? They're not part of the like, specifically religious uh, um, administration. There's um, like a kind of new practice of leaving prayers at these Confucian temples for things like exams, um, and and that wasn't traditionally like within the tradition something that was done, and yet that I think I think it started. It, it's sort of an import from some Japanese practices, um, you know. So I think we're seeing ritual innovation in ways that we don't expect, and sometimes it doesn't even happen where you're looking to see it. You know, it's going to happen in the you know cultural heritage museum side of the government organization, right? On that note, I think we have truly honoured the Bartlett bequest. So will you thank with me our three colleagues for their brilliant presentations.